Hello everyone, good afternoon to you in Hawaii, good morning to those of you in Japan. This is Looking to the East. This is a uh, twice weekly show where we look at various topics in and around Asia, mostly focusing on Japan. I'm your host, uh, Steve Zerker. I'm a professor of management and dean at Kansai Gaidai University. Uh, there was an election just a couple days ago on Sunday, actually on Halloween, in Japan. And uh, I decided to create a show to take a look at those election results, which are now complete, have been fully reported. So that's the topic of this show. Uh, this is going to be an overview of the Japanese political system, because I, I don't assume everyone has an understanding of how Japanese politics is structured and how it works. Then we'll get into the election itself and look at the repercussions of the election on the U.S.-Japan relationship. We're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Taro Tsuda with us today. He's a recent graduate of Harvard University with a doctorate degree in Japanese history. And he also is a teacher, as I am, <clears throat> at Kansai Gaidai University, uh, teaching history and other subjects. So, Taro, welcome to the show. Thank you. This is your second visit to the show. Uh, the third time you actually get a prize, so uh, we'll work on having you come for the third time. So thank you so much for making time early our Tuesday morning here in Japan uh, to meet with me and talk about Japanese politics. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. So I think, as I mentioned, <clears throat> it might be a good idea, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, maybe give an overview of the evolution of Japanese politics uh, since uh, World War II. We don't have much time, but if you could briefly describe for our audience how the Japanese government was formed, what type of government it is, and how it's been functioning um, since uh, those days, the 1940s and 1950s, up until uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. Um, so. Uh, so Japan had a parliamentary system um, similar to the British system in some aspects before World War II. However, the um, parliament, which is known as the National Diet, had relatively little power compared to unelected parts of the government. Then that was the system that lasted till the end of World War II. And then after Japan lost in World War II, uh, there was the American occupation. And it, under the American occupation, one of the big goals was to democratize Japan fully. And so many different policies were passed by the um, occupation authorities to do that. And one of them was to create a new constitution in Japan, which was um, enacted in 1947. And this set up the current structures that exist in the Japanese uh, government today, because this constitution has not yet been revised even once in, in, uh, Jap since it was enacted. And so all the structures in that constitution are there today, including the parliament, which is now, or the national diet, which is now the top body of government in Japan and other structures. And, and so under this system, uh, political parties were able to fully have the power, the um, power that they do in mature democracies elsewhere in the world. And um, very soon after, uh, many different parties formed. And it was a quite messy period during the occupation because there were a lot of parties forming and changing. But by 1955, they settled on a new system where um, a big conservative party called the Liberal Democratic Party for formed from the merger of two smaller parties. And there were parties on the left that merged into the Socialist Party, which no longer is influential in Japan. But the Liberal Democratic Party has stayed the most uh, largest and most influential party in Japan since that time. And there are a number of reasons that scholars discuss for why it has stayed this the strongest party. It only lost power twice since it was formed in 1955 for quite brief periods. So. Um, I don't, I don't know if I should go on, but. Yeah, uh, I, I think it'd be interesting if you could give maybe the top two reasons why essentially Japan is a one party state. 
It's, uh, you mentioned there's only been two periods of time since 1955 when the Liberal Democratic Party was not in direct control of the levers of power here in the country. <clears throat> uh, are there cultural reasons for this, or is it uh, the alignment of the uh, Liberal Party with business interests or other interests? How would you explain this? So maybe the top two reasons as to why, you know, I've been in Japan a long time, and it's always, the, the elections are kind of a foregone conclusion. It's uh, just how strong, how many votes, uh, diet members, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, Democratic Party will have. It's not like there's much of a chance for them to lose power. Why is that? Um. Well, I think uh, from the beginning, they had a lot of structural advantages. Um, so some of the biggest, most well-organized uh, constituencies or social groups in Japan were part of the coalition from the beginning. And that included um, farmers and rural voters in Japan. In the beginning, Japan was a much more rural country. So this was a bigger part of the population than now. But um, that was one big part. Then small business owners and also big business owners. And then um, they also forged very useful alliances with the bureaucracy as well as big business, which provided a lot of funds and, um, and uh, financial support for the party, which it could use to dole out uh, sort of material benefits to its constituencies in different local areas. So I think this electoral machine and what they call the iron triangle between the, the LDP, the, the Liberal Democratic Party, the bureaucracy and um, big business was a big part of why they could stay in power for so long. So that was forged in the early days back in the 1950s and has been consistent throughout the decades of their control. Well, there have been important uh, social and uh, socioeconomic changes in Japan, which changed the situation somewhat because it urbanized and people moved from countryside to city. And so people were afraid that this would erode the support of the Liberal Democratic Party. But um, they were able to adapt, I think, relatively well. And um, there were also the structural weaknesses on the opposite side, the opposition never having a chance to be in power, they couldn't really prove themselves to much of the public. And so um, I think many Japanese people have tended to go with what they know and what they trust over time. So that's a big part of it as well, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that desire for stability, <clears throat> which is uh, rooted in the, the cultural aspects of Japan, <clears throat> I think maybe in part, a cultural explanation beyond the political ones that uh, you were given. You know, I, I teach culture classes, maybe you do that too also, and <clears throat> Japan's profile when it comes to cultural analysis, like Hofstede's work, uh, has a, a low tolerance for uncertainty. So it may be that even if the Liberal Democratic Party doesn't do all that good a job, uh, there's still a sense, well, we need to keep them in power because we don't know who would be able to replace them. So that's interesting for Americans. Um, uh, some of the same principles that you talked about, the patronage system and the vested interests are also there, but we seem to have uh, greater variability in, in terms of who's in control of uh, Congress or, or the White House. So I think it's important to note too for our, our viewers that in a parliamentary system, uh, the prime minister is not elected directly. He's actually elected by the party, right? Um, yeah, so um, in a parliamentary system, uh, first the party chooses the, the party chooses its leader, and then um, there's a parliamentary election, and the, the party that wins the most seats tends to become the governing party, either by itself or in coalition. So. It's a more indirect selection of the, the head of government than in the US. And uh, we have a new prime minister. He's what been in power for about a month or so now. He was appointed before this election occurred. And now his status has been confirmed 
by the election results uh, just, just this last Sunday, Japan Time Sunday. So let's talk about the next topic, and that is the election itself. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, as I thought about the various elements that were leading up to the election and some of the predictions that were made by uh, the Japanese media and also the English media that covers Japan, uh, the topics that were covered was the uh, Liberal Democratic Party's management of the COVID pandemic, which I don't think anyone would describe as successful, although the numbers now are, are very, very low. But over the last year and a half, it's Japan was somewhat slow to respond, and the inoculations, vaccines came in later than, than other countries. <clears throat> During the Olympics, the COVID infection rate was very high. So I think that was a concern that many uh, analysts looked at and said this may be a factor that will negatively affect the Liberal Democratic Party's power. Then economically, Japan has been in uh, a malaise for decades now. <clears throat> and despite the efforts of the Liberal Democratic Party, especially under Prime Minister Abe, to try and revitalize and re-energize the uh, Japanese business uh, environment and uh, wages and so forth, also to try and get out of a depressionary cycle that uh, Japan has been in. Prices have been trending down over the last 20 years or so. So that was another factor that uh, the analysts were looking at and saying this could have a, a negative impact on how the how what results will occur for the party in power. So those are two things that I, I thought about and uh, many people were predicting that the Liberal Democratic Party would, not, would, would of course be still the dominant party but would probably lose a number of seats. But the election results are in and it seems like they're just about as strong as they were previously. Taro, would, do you agree with uh, this kind of analysis that I've given that, that those were negative factors. They, they were kind of facing uh, wins in the election, and many people were predicting that they would suffer as a result of that. But in the end, the Japanese people decided that they wanted to keep the, the uh, Liberal Democratic Party at, at relatively the same level of influence. Basically, they, they completely control all levers of government at this point, after the election on Sunday. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's a very uh, good uh, assessment of the situation. Um, I think there was sort of skepticism or a little bit negative um, view towards the Japanese, uh, the Japanese government's approach towards the pandemic and some aspects of economic uh, recovery. Um, but right before the election, I think there were several things that kind of made the party's outlook a little bit um, more bright than than it had been for several months before. And so one was that the um, the prime minister at the, the earlier prime minister, Prime Minister Suga, who was getting a lot of the blame or or pressure about the um, pandemic response, he decided not to run for re-election as the party leader. And so I think that kind of scrambled the situation a little bit because the opposition couldn't rely on using him as a, a a foil or a um oh i see someone to blame and then um so that was one factor and kishida the current prime minister um is it so was a kind of change of face for the party and then another thing is that the pandemic's numbers went down quite dramatically in the past few weeks and so um the the people started to be maybe a little bit more optimistic so i think those things really helped the timing of the election and Prime Minister Kishida, the new Prime Minister knew that and so that's why he chose to hold this election as soon as possible because the Prime Minister has that um, power in Japan to call a, a snap election. And so he thought now's the time to do it before um, things get worse again if they do. So so I think that helped the, ele the election re results for um, yeah, let's, it's uh, important to note that the last uh, national election was four years ago, so it, it has been quite a while. <clears throat> Unlike the American system, which holds elections at periodic 
dates, you know, every two years or every four years, depending or every six years, depending on the office holder. The national election in Japan is at the discretion of the party in power and the prime minister who is in that position at that time. So you well, can see clearly, yeah, there was a strategy to appointing a new prime minister, having a fresh face, so to speak, although in my opinion, Taro, all these guys are pretty much the same. They're part of the same inner circle. But, you know, ostensibly, there is a new person who has become prime minister and to have the election very soon after that to create a sense of newness, perhaps. Yeah, and um, well, uh, in terms of the timing of elections, there is about a, a four year um, period for the um, the, the diet members hold their seat. So that a little bit limits the length of time that they can go without an election. But within that period, the prime minister can choose when to hold a sooner election if he if he feels it's it's good for um, for his mandate or for the party's um, performance. So, so we were coming up on that four year limit uh, on Sunday. Yes, I guess. It, this time it came up very close to the. To oh, the, okay. Yeah, I think the election in 2017 was in the late latter part of the year as well, maybe uh, November, if I remember correctly. That's a while ago. And as you alluded to in your description of the political system, the opposition um, to the Liberal Democratic Party is relatively weak. And one thing that they did do for this election is uh, they attempted to cooperate with each other. So there's the Constitutional Democratic Party, correct me if I'm using the wrong terms here, and then the Japanese Communist Party, which is, I guess, a legacy from those post-World War II days. And a number of other smaller parties agreed to collaborate and not run against each other. So therefore, to, to split the opposition vote. But uh, from what I read, uh, it turned out to be a, a, a failure. It didn't work. It didn't excite uh, the Japanese voters at all, which led to this result of the Liberal Democratic, the Democratic Party still being very much strongly in control here. Well, do you have any opinions about that? It's, it really I, looked like it was I a think, failure. I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of this election, how, how that strategy worked out. I think. Um, I think in some ways it was like a double-edged sword because um, in some some districts it did make it more competitive, um, the the race. And some of the LDP's actually top people did did lose, like um, uh, Amari Akira, who was the LDP Secretary General, who's considered the most the second most important party official. He actually lost his race to to uh, opposition person. Um, he was able to come back because there's a proportional representation aspect to this election. So if you're high enough on the party list, you can still survive as a proportional representation um, candidate. But he lost the one-to-one -one re race with his opponent. And there are other examples like that. So, so it did make it more competitive in some districts. But on the other hand, um, the parties, the opposition party's image sometimes suffered because people were skeptical of the alliance between these very different parties. So some people were hesitant to make an alliance with the communists and vice versa. And so um, for the opposition, some people weren't comfortable with voting for it because they didn't want um, some of the other parties to do well. And this turned out interestingly too, because um, another opposition party, the, the Nippon Ishin no Kai or Japan Innovation Party turned out to do very well, especially in the, the region of Kansai and um, Osaka, because um, people saw that as a more palatable um, third choice than the main opposition and the oh. Dem liberal democratic party. So um, even in our um, campuses, district, the, the opposition candidate who was the incumbent lost to a Nippon Ishin no Kai um, candidate. So, and oh, he was okay. a quite important, he was a quite important um, figure in the opposition. Um, he served in the Democratic uh, Party of Japan government a few years ago during the brief time that LDP 
was out of power, and but he lost after many, uh, many terms. So mm -hmm. I found that result very, um, very interesting. That is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, um, I, I think I've met the, the uh, former Diet member. He may have come to our university maybe when the new campus was opening, or I think there was some special occasion when he visited, and I happened to be there when that occurred. So now there's a new Diet representation, and it's Ishin Nokai. Well, the, you know, the story of that party is very interesting, but uh, that's, that's well, it's something we'd have to look at in a different show. We have a question from a viewer here. Uh, let me go ahead and read it. It actually is a nice segue to what I wanted to talk about next. The question is, uh, do the election results affect the recent nomination of Rahm Emanuel as ambassador to Japan from the United States? So let's address that question. But first, let's talk about this election and I guess Kishida in particular. Uh, Taro, do you think that uh, there's going to be any significant change one way or the other in terms of the Japan-U.S. relationship as a result of this election? Or is it pretty much going to be the same as it has been? My, my sense is that it would not change much because um, as, we, as we discussed, the LDP's majority uh, shrunk only a very small amount, and it's still a quite strong majority, especially when you combine it with its coalition partner, Komeito. The, there's a smaller junior coalition partner that the LDP works with. And so um, the, the current line of very strong U.S.-Japan relations, I don't think would change much um, in this post-election environment. I think um, Perhaps there will be a push towards um, stronger cooperation with the U.S. on um, uh, on sort of uh, checking China because that was a big issue in the leadership party leadership race before this election. How to check um, the growing power of China? So maybe there will be more emphasis on that. But that has been something I think President Biden has already been focused on. So it would just be following the same direction they were going in before. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's a, an item of uh, very intense discussion um, um, it, within the Japanese government and within the American government as well. So, yeah, you're right. That'll probably continue in terms of uh, Kishida himself. Uh, he, of course, uh, is a part of the inner circle and was very is and was very strongly connected to Prime Minister Abe. He was, I think, Abe's number two for a while. I, I, the reason I say that is a friend of mine who's a professor at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu, has a picture of Abe and Kishida visiting Hawaii on a, some kind of trip a number of years ago. And they're, they're right next to each other. They're standing right next to each other. So clearly, Kishida is a part of that central group, those uh, the most influential power brokers within the Liberal Democratic Party. But there has been some indication that Kishida is maybe more uh, liberal, if you know, we're, we're talking relatively here because the liberal, the liberal Democratic Party is a conservative party, but that he his policies, maybe when it comes to uh, social issues is a little bit more liberal or progressive in a sense, than the, pri the prior Prime Minister Suga or Prime Minister Abe, who was before that. So do you think that, that it, it, well, first of all, do you think that that's true, that he is somewhat different from the previous prime ministers? And if that is true, would his personality or his way of doing things maybe influence the relationship with, with uh, the United States? Um, to a degree, I think um, there is some ideological difference with um, Prime Minister Abe um, and Prime Minister Suga. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that makes uh, Prime Minister Kishida um, very adapt, adept as a politician is to kind of be able to adapt to different um, and work with many different types of people. And that's probably why he emerged as a consensus candidate in this very recent leadership election, because many different groups did not have a big problem with him. And so um, that's how he got the most votes in that. But um, in terms of um, 
I think one difference that has come up is that he's been talking about um, a new form, a new capitalism, which means like a more, um, I guess maybe what you might call compassionate conservatism that that President Bush used for for a few years back, but that kind of approach to um, capitalism in Japan. So a little bit modifying the Abenomics um, plan, but I'm not sure how much uh, substance is really in that. Maybe that was more a rhetorical tool for um, for him to win the election. So we have to see if he'll actually really do uh, significant policies to um, to ex um, expand social benefits or give out pandemic aid, for example. So um, that was a one clear sort of distinction I saw raised in the past few months. Yeah, I, I think Bush used that as a uh, basically a campaign tactic. And in the end, uh, there really wasn't a significant difference in terms of the, the United States policy under the Bush administration. So it'll be interesting to see if Kishida actually implements some reduction in the income inequality, which is occurring in Japan as it is in the United States, and it is pretty much worldwide. Um, so I guess to address the last uh, the question we asked, uh, it doesn't seem like there'll be a material effect on the Rahm Emanuel nomination, which is wending its way through Congress right now. I would, affect, I would guess that maybe sometime late this year, he will be uh, approved by the Senate and will take, place as, take his place in Tokyo as the ambassador a representative of the United States to Japan. That's going to be very interesting. I've done shows on that, by the way, Taro, is, about, is he the right person to be the ambassador or not? Because he has some very strong pluses, obviously, and he also may have some strong negatives as well. I'm not sure they know of, in Japan, I'm not sure people are really aware of how, con how he's seen as controversial in the US. So um, I don't think from the Japanese side, there would be much uh, pushback. Um, yeah, that doesn't seem to be being played up uh, in in the Japanese media so much, and and you know I guess it doesn't need to be, but uh, yes, in the United States, it it, it he is a controversial uh, politician. He was a mayor of Chicago, and he made various decisions when he was in that position that uh, the more liberal aspects of the Democratic Party take great issue with, and they're trying to stop his his nomination process, but I, it doesn't look likely that they're going to be able to do that because Biden has picked him. Okay, we're out of time. Taro, as always, this goes by so quickly. Thank you so much for your overview of Japanese politics, your analysis of the election. Uh, you're, uh, you're a professor of modern Japanese history. I, I should have made that clear. So you're very carefully watching what's going on in Japan uh, as, yeah, as of today. So um, we'll have to see. I guess the, the next election is somewhere in, in the distant future, I would imagine. There's Don't an upper anything. house election next year. So the other oh, right. house yes, of, the, of the parliament, the diet, will be elected right. next year. Yeah, it was the lower house. The election occurred on Sunday. The upper house, or I guess you can think of it as the Congress versus the Senate. Is, is that a rough equivalency? Although in Japan's case, the upper house is less powerful. So to the the lower house that was just elected um, is has a lot more power in Japanese politics, but um, both. Do you anticipate the same type of results uh, for the upper house election next year? Would it will we see the continuation of the pretty much the stranglehold that the uh, Liberal Democratic Party has on the upper house as it does now on the lower house? They don't expect to lose power, but I think many people are watching to see how uh, Prime Minister Kishida does. And depending on that, the results may of that election may change a lot. So I think more than this current previous one, people are looking to that to see as a test of, um, or an indication of how he's doing, so. Oh, I see. All right. Well, thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was great. I really appreciate you participating this morning. Thank you very much thank everyone you. for tuning in and watching. Uh, we'll have another show in a couple of weeks on another topic relating to Japan or maybe more broadly Asia. I'm Dr. Steven Zerker. Thank you so much. This is Looking to the East.